attended Radnor High School, just down the road. <laughs> Her home base is now in San Francisco, where she writes books and screenplays and shares her life with her husband, Edward Lichty, and her two daughters. She's a graduate of the University of Richmond and San Francisco State University, where she received a master's in literature. And in addition to the middle place, she's also the author of another book called Lift, a kind of open letter to her daughters about parenting and much more. And she shared with me that she's currently working on a third book. We're extremely honored to be able to host her tonight, Ellie.
thinking about the tattoo and then the bathing. And, um, and it finishes with my father finishing a certain leg of his treatment, and then every other chapter is a flashback to childhood, partially because the book required considerable comic relief, and I had a comical childhood with comical people. As Skinny McKinney can tell you, my brothers were, uh, were well, a lot, a lot of stories, a lot of stories to choose from. And the other reason I felt like I wanted to go back and forth like that is because I was discovering over the course of writing it that the emotional content of our lives doesn't really change that much. The consequences change, but actually the feelings are very similar. So, for instance, the vanity that you feel when you're putting your hair in Princess Leia buns for your first prom, <laughs> which was a mistake, <laughs> is not unlike the vanity you feel when you walk out of the house for the first time without hair. And the anxiety you feel when your brother brings home a boa constrictor to live in your house as a pet, even though totally wasn't allowed to do that, is not unlike the anxiety you feel going into surgery. Um, so I thought tonight that I would just read um, a chapter from the middle place. My chapters are really short if you just checked your watch and had a little panic. Um, and then around 10.30, I thought I'd finish it. Um, right, we're going to 11, he said. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the, the book moves so fast that people often say that they read it in an afternoon just so excellent to think that you couldn't put it down. Though completely horrifying to think that something that took me two years to do is <laughs> just something to keep you entertained while the laundry dries. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the second book and read from that, and then we can have questions, and then I'll sign all your books, and then I'm going to dinner at Morimoto. I know, aren't I fancy? I'm making Charlie Ryan take me. He's the kid from my class, I think, that ended up with the biggest bundle. Um, <laughs> did I say that on the microphone? <laughs> okay. My dad, I think the only thing you need to know to follow is I have these two daughters, Georgia and Claire. I have, my husband's name's Edward. He's from Little Rock. I think that's relevant in this chapter. Um, and we call my dad Greeny. I'm not really allowed to say on a microphone why, but you can find the answer on page 276. <laughs> my dad is on his way to Oakland, probably clad in his Radnor lacrosse sweats. I'm due for my first chemo on Monday morning. With a life driven by sales, sports, sales, and Catholicism, my dad's MO will doubtlessly involve attacking it, staying positive, and having faith. I'm not quite there. I've been so grown up in so many meetings and conversations and appointments lately. Such a big girl, such a good girl. With my dad in the house, I'm someone's child again. Someone else, someone else has to get me a nice tea, make me some dinner, bring me a cookie. Just thinking about how good it's going to be to have him around makes me well up. By the time I spot him on the curb at the airport, I am trembling. Ah, lovey, he says as he squeezes me and rocks me side to side. Lovey, we're going to do it, kid. We're going to get it done. The green man is here, lovey. I hold on a long time, crying and whispering yeah over and over again. When we come through the front door, Edward is waiting for us. They hug a nice, loud man hug. Green man, thanks for coming, man, Edward says while they pat each other on the back. Ark, my dad says. Ark, God bless you. My dad named Edward Arkansas Ed <laughs> before he even met him, when he was just a guy who took me to a concert. I have to pause and say, I feel like you'll get this because you're filling people. So I'm in California. I really had not brought a boyfriend home ever because I have these two older brothers and they're really funny and confident and I just thought they'll eat him alive, <laughs> whoever he was. And then I met Edward and I thought, no, you won't eat him alive. I think I'll bring him home. So I bring him home. I, I go home first. I'm going for Christmas and then he's going to come for New Year's. And I'm talking to him on the telephone, you know, like you do when you're in love, just talking about nothing, just wanting to hear the voice. And I look on my mom's bulletin board in Villanova, and there's a printed invitation that says, it's a party, and the name of the party is Meet Arkansas Ed. <laughs> Which was billed to me as like, you know, Patsy and Bill are going to come over and meet Edward. And then, you know, I think Betty and Bebe are going to come too. 
but he didn't run. <laughs> Come on in, Greeny, I'll take that. Edward runs the suitcase upstairs. Green man calls from the second floor. Got some kettle one for you. We're Irish, that's the other thing you need to know. <laughs> Whoa, our top shelf, fantastic. How about I start with a beer, though? My dad is talking into the fridge, searching out a cold beer, something to ease him into the vodka. I'm smiling. Edward is down at the stairs in no time, and the girls are at Amy's for dinner. Greeny, I got you some Bud Lights. You know, we usually have that heavy California beer, but I know you Philly guys love a Bud. My dad pulls out a can of beer and opens one for Edward and raises his eyebrow at me, and I nod, and he hands me his and leans in the fridge for another, and there we are, just like any other visit, having a cold beer together. Big day on Monday. I try to say it like my dad would, like it's a lacrosse game or a job interview, but I'm not greeny, and I start crying. Lovey, he says as he runs his big, rough hand in circles on my rounded back. You gotta stay positive. Right, Ark? We gotta stay positive. I want to wail like Georgia did last week when she slipped in the bathroom and hit her head on the tub and raged, writhing, then sniveling into Edward's shoulder, leaving a big wet spot of tears and snot on his work shirt. But right then, with his hands still going in circles on my back, my dad says, Ark, tell me about Johnny Depp. Is he the real deal? Am I supposed to take him seriously? <laughs> and Edward tells him, yes, he's definitely the real deal. And they talk a little about Johnny Depp movies until they can't remember what, he's, what movie he's in right now, and I actually hear myself say, it's Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> and they say, right, right, that's it. It's the same trick we use when the girl starts getting into despair. Oh, sweetie, don't cry, we'll find your bunny slipper. Look, look over there, look at Mr. Piggy. He's all alone in the living room. You better give Mr. Piggy a hug. I sleep better that night, partly because I take two Ambien instead of one, <laughs> and partly because Creamy is here patting around in his Brooks Brothers pajamas, delighting the girls by letting them watch him pop out his dentures and promising to let Georgia paint his toenails the next day. <laughs> Over a breakfast of chocolate chip cookies and coffee, I asked Greeny if he's ever had a pedicure. He laughs because his toenails are prehistoric. <laughs> I love pedicures, but I'm too cheap to get them. I want him to treat me. That, and I'm kind of starved for his particular energy, so I want him to come along. You gonna leave the girls here with Ark? Ark, you okay with that? My dad asks, which of course Edward is, because you can have anything you want when you have cancer, especially in the beginning. Of course, Edward says, sounds great to me, lovey. We drive down College Avenue toward Berkeley and pull up to Galaxy Nails, where they have an empty row of massage chairs. The door's been propped open with a little foam wedge of pink toenail separators. The Korean sisters who run the place wave us in. We climb up into our thrones and I explain to Greeny how to use the chair controls. Rolling thunder, beating, wave, beating hands, ocean waves. Lovey, fantastic. Then he looks toward the sisters. Ladies, I'm just an old billy goat in from a first pedicure. <laughs> he settles in like a regular with the New York Times on his lap. I try to warn the sisters about his toenails. <laughs> but words become unnecessary. <laughs> As he slides his crooked feet out of his updated dock siders that have molded to the shape of his feet. Two of his toes are taped together with white athletic tape. And have been for years. One of, they are right the second. One of the sisters rolls up his pant leg and guides his feet into churning warm, in the churning warm water and he lets out a long sigh. His contentedness spreads. We are all happy. That evening, Edward is barbecuing pork tenderloins, and I'm drinking too much. Because drinking feels so good. Everything is funnier, less pointy and sharp. Our friends Daryl and Allison are over, and we're talking about my treatment plan, like I've had cancer for years, and we all know the routine. After dinner, we laze around the living room on our worn-out IKEA sofas, and I drink more red wine, and my eyes are bloodshot. I'm listening to my husband and Daryl play guitar. My dad wants to hear Sweet Caroline, and even though they don't know the chords, they wing it, and Greeny sings the words he can remember in whatever order they come to him. <laughs> and Edward is laughing with Daryl. Georgia is in her zip-up fleece pajamas with the baggy bottom, and she wants to hear her favorite song, which is Daryl and Edward's best one, The Only Living Boy in New York. We've gone through two bottles of wine already, but I notice my dad opened another red without even asking if anyone wants more. I have to pause and tell you a funny story about my mom. Uh, so when you write a book, 
you hand in the final manuscript, and then someday, some later day, something in the mail comes and it's found. And it's an advanced reader copy, and it's a paperback, and they send it to all the radio stations and newspapers and stuff to see if they can get some traction for your book. So I got two in the mail. And you know, I'm in my driveway, like biggest moment of my life other than my kids and stuff. And <coughs> super private, I'm alone, freaking out. I turn, I turn around and shoot one right back to my parents. Fast forward two years, I'm home, I'm doing a reading, I'm, I finish a reading, I go to my mom's, but she's the only one with a good bed, would have lain. I go in her bed to take a little nap, and I put my head down and I look over, and there's the ARC, the advanced reader copy, with these little pages folded over. <laughs> and I think, oh my God, I'm finally gonna know what she really thought. <laughs> And I open it to this page, and where I said that my dad opened another bottle of wine, she had done math. <laughs> there were six adults there, four glasses of wine per bottle, how many glasses of wine per adult? It's like, wow, well, mom, you're really swept up in the emotion of that scene. Now, <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. He refills everyone while Edward and Daryl play for Georgia. She won't sing out loud, but she stares at her dad's face as he sings, and her lips move to the words. She adores him. Imprints are being made. Then Allison suggests this old song by the guy from Little Feet called Roll em Easy. It's the first song I ever heard Edward play. When he gets to the line I like, he looks across at me with his pinchy guitar playing face and says, I've dined in palaces, drunk wine with kings and queens. But darling, oh darling, you're the best thing I've ever seen. I shift my position on the sofa so my head is on a big, lumpy pillow in Greenie's lap, and Georgia is leaning back against my middle, and Claire is just about asleep on the floor. Allison and I catch eyes, and she tilts her head and smiles. And when I smile back, we both well up with tears. I think because we both recognize that whatever else may be unfolding, this is happening. good segue to Lyft. Um, so Lyft really came about because after I would do readings from the middle place, I would have conversations during the book signing portion where people would tell me about their greenies or their personal health crisis. And it seemed like the, all these conversations, hundreds of conversations, were starting to fall into this pattern where there's a phone call. I feel like a lot of bad things start with a scary phone call. Then there's a period of panic then there's work, dissolving a marriage, saving a marriage, finding a new job, moving, going through chemotherapy, whatever it is, there's this huge body of work to be done. And then after the work, and after it's better, and after you know, the seas have calmed, there is a sense of gratitude, or at least this sense that you have now been given um, full access to um, the greatest conversations that humanity has to offer. And I felt like the quality of my interactions with people since the day I got diagnosed have been richer and realer and better in every way. And uh, I can't take that away from me. And I had this on my mind, and I had these stories in my mind of brave, brave people that had been through things that I admired them for. Um, when I went to visit my friend Tracy Tuttle, whose husband is a hang glider of all things. And I was talking to him and I was giving him the third degree about hang gliding, you know, like how long are you up there and where do you go to the bathroom and don't you get hungry and how do you know where you're going? And, um, and then he said this line that just sort of hit me between the eyes, which is basically you just fly from thermal to thermal looking for lift. And I was like, boy, don't you? And so he went on to explain that Thermals are this column of hot air surrounded by turbulence. And if you can get through the turbulence, or you can even sometimes follow another glider into turbulence, someone who's more experienced, <coughs> then you'll be you'll get into the hot air and it'll pull you up to a different altitude and it'll give you a different quality of flight and a different vantage point entirely. And that's where the good flights are. And so that that sort of landed the idea for me 
it or cemented it. And then I had to figure out what stories to tell and which to leave out. And so I ended up with these three stories. Um, my own, and so I started with my own, which is that my daughter, Claire, had meningitis, um, bacterial meningitis. Is, if it goes untreated, it's almost always fatal. And so it was this incredible in, introduction into what a brave and bold and dangerous thing it is to be someone's parent. Um, it was also an introduction to the myriad ways that kids can be hurt and damaged and diseased because you spend, when you have meningitis, you just go to the hospital and you get hooked up to IV antibiotics <coughs> and um, you just wait. And you're amongst other people who are living through much, 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 um, ultimately for us, much more difficult situations. Um, and you just can't help but internalize um, what a daring thing we do when we um, have children. And then the second story happened that same summer, which is that my cousin Kathy's son died in a car accident, uh, the way that 19-year-old boys sometimes do. And uh, it completely changed every, has continued to change every day of my life with my kids. And then the third thing was a really good thing, which is, well, it was a good thing that was born of a tough thing, which is that my friend Meg uh, really was not finding Mr. Wright, and she had to decide what to do about that in terms of her fertility. And, um, and she did something about it. And I'll leave the rest to you to read and experience. It's a very short book. If you read that in an afternoon, you're gonna read this on the potty. <laughs> but I will read you just a taste of it. At the very last minute, um, I decided to write it as a letter to my kids. Um, and so you'll hear that in this, in this passage. <coughs> People rarely rave about their childhoods, and it's no wonder. So many mistakes are made. I see how that happens now, how we all create future work for our kids by checking our cell phones while you are mid-story or sticking you in the basement to watch a movie because we love you, but we don't really want to be with you anymore that day. <laughs> or coming unhinged over all manner of spilt milk, wet towels, unflushed toilets, lost brand new whatevers. Almost every day, although I've gotten a lot better, almost every day I yell at one of you so loudly that my throat hurts afterward. That's why I keep lozenges in practically every drawer in the house. I hold it together and hold it together, and then when the bickering picks up, I just detonate. Like yesterday, Claire, when I listened to you whine through two rounds of some card game called Egyptian War. Finally, it was George's turn to go first, and you said you couldn't play anymore because your armpits were sore. <laughs> Stupid, Georgia said, and you cried, stupid is a mean word, and smacked Georgia with your open palm as I watched. Go to your room right now, Missy, I hollered. It was an accident. I fell into her on accident. <laughs> you both froze, and I got to my feet and leaned down into your faces and ranted at you through set teeth like the heartless, tyrannical caretakers in movies about orphans. <laughs> I was so disgusted with both of you your impatient overreactions, your loss of self-control, and then I turned right around and disgusted myself. If John Lennon was right that life is what happens when you're making other plans, parenthood is what happens when everything is flipped over and spilling everywhere and you can't find a towel or a sponge or your inside voice. But if my temper has made you hesitant or tentative, is there any atoning for that? In a parent-teacher conference last year, Ms. Tunney said with obvious hesitation, Sometimes your daughter has a bit of an edge. <laughs> I cried when I left the classroom. I knew. There are other mistakes, less obvious. I don't mirror your emotions enough, though I can't say why, because when I do, it seems to calm me down. I forget to praise your effort instead of your achievement. I discipline by carrot and stick instead of reason, and I ignore the indisputable research about the benefits of family dinner. I'm a zero when it comes to the culinary arts. Everything tastes like ground shoelaces. Except my salads, which you are years away from appreciating. Until then, we go over to Beth's house and trade wine for dinner. It's a brilliant solution. But sometimes, on the way home, when you go on and on about how Beth is such a good cook, and then Dad adds his accolades about Beth's homemade red sauce and roasted broccolini and how you ate every bite, my mom ego twitches and cramps. 
I used to be pretty chill, as I once heard dad say to his friend Graham when I turned down a corona at a two-year-old's birthday party. For instance, before I was your mom, I didn't have one of those plastic dividers for my silverware. I'd just take the basket out of the dishwasher and dump all the knives, forks, and spoons right into the drawer. My friends Andy and Mike, who coached me through the last of my single years, still talk about it. I went around the world without a credit card or a cell phone or a plan of any sort. I hitchhiked a thousand miles. I went to dead shows with people whose last names I did not know. I wore green Birkenstocks to the office. <laughs> I thought I'd be cooler as a mom, but then I leaned back on the delivery table and Dr. Laura Stachel pulled out a baby. And somewhere between the precious bundle that was Georgia and the placenta, all that it's cool, no worries, sure, why not stuff came out too. My default answer to everything is no. As soon as I hear the inflection of inquiry in your voice, the word no forms in my mind. <laughs> Sometimes accompanied by a reason, often not. Can I open the mail? No. Can I wear your necklace? No. When is dinner? No. <coughs> what you probably wouldn't believe is how much I want to say yes. Yes, you can take two dozen books home from the library. Yes, you can eat a whole roll of sweet tarts. Yes, you can camp out on a deck. But the books will get lost, and sweet tarts will eventually make your tongue bleed. And if you sleep on the deck, the neighborhood raccoons will nibble on you in the night. I often wish I could come back to life as your uncle, so I could give you more. But when you're the mom, your whole life is holding the rope against these wily secret agents who never ever stop trying to get you to drop your end. This tug of war often obscures what's also happening between us. I'm your mother, first mile of your road me and all my obvious and hidden limitations. That means that in addition to possibly wrecking you, I have the chance to give you what was given to me, a decent childhood, more good memories than bad, some values, a sense of, a sense of tribe, a run and happiness. You can't imagine how seriously I take that, even as I fail you. Mothering you is the first thing of consequence that I have ever done.